and I did an event. And after the event, this, uh, this lady came up in the signing, uh, signing line, and she, she was very pleasant. She was, you know, this wasn't a confrontational encounter. And she, but she came up to me and she said, you know something, you're going to be far more successful posthumously. <laughs> The library was my space, and there was just so much. To the Harbor Grace excursion with the boys to have a time. First well. off, when did you arrive into the city? Uh, yesterday. Yesterday. I arrived in Toronto yesterday. I'd been briefly in the United States. I'd been in New York. And then I went to Minneapolis, uh, where there's a very big crime convention, crime novels. And... Uh, <laughs> And Taking uh, up a new hobby, have you? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I like these, these crime, crime fiction conventions. I, I went to one uh, some years ago in Muncie, Indiana. <laughs> and Muncie, Indiana is a, is a fascinating place. It's Ar Averageville, USA. It's where they test things to see if, if they'll be accepted. So if something, they show a film in Muncie, Indiana, and if it goes down very well, then wow. they say it's going to run extremely well in Indiana. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, anyway, Muncie, Indiana, I, went to, uh, I, I went, went to this convention, invited to this convention, uh, which was um, attended by about 350, um, mostly ladies. Uh, I, there were a couple of men um, who were there, but mostly, uh, mostly ladies. Mm -hmm. And it's the only conference uh, that I've ever been to where uh, most of the participants uh, were knitting all the time. <laughs> oh <my goodness. laughs> you know, like the trick of turs at the guillotine. <laughs> and where they were, were, for some reason, they were all wearing hats. Mm. So I don't know what I'd... But they were wonderful hosts. Oh. Uh, really a tremendous host. And I was terribly taken with Muncie, Indiana, with the result that I've, I've mentioned it in my books uh, many times since then, and people wonder why Muncie, Indiana is mentioned. <laughs> yeah. And it's because, uh, because I rather liked, uh, rather liked it. <laughs> So anyway, so uh, um, BoucherCon, which was the conference in, uh, in uh, Minneapolis, is a very big, it's much bigger than the conference in Muncie, Indiana. 1,700 people, of whom 800 were authors. Imagine having 800 authors all desperate to get their book to the front of the table. My goodness. It was most unseemly scenes, you know. <laughs> Well, thank goodness you're here with us in Toronto <laughs> now. I, I hear at a busy time with our international, Toronto International Film, uh, film Festival. Yes, uh, I was wondering yes. if, you ha if you came across a celebrity at the airport, perhaps? Well, I wonder, I was hoping to get a part if I went. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dressed like I mean, this, I don't think it would be a problem. <laughs> presumably, there are lots of people who hang around there just hoping that somebody will see their, 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 their better side. And, uh, <laughs> So now no, I'm not that desperate, but nonetheless. But you, you must enjoy a certain degree of um, celebrity now. Have, have you lost some anonymity with the success of e your... Yes, I have, to an extent. I mean, I, uh, I, you do lose a bit of an anonymity when, when you write books and, and people are generous enough to read them. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you do lose a bit of that. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, I, I suppose one's grateful for what, obviously, all of us are grateful for what, whatever su success we meet in life. Although I, I did, I was on tour uh, a few years back uh, in, um, uh, I was in Atlanta, Georgia, and I did an event. And after the event, this, uh, this lady came up in the signing, uh, signing line, and she, she was very pleasant. She was, you know, this wasn't a confrontational encounter. And she, but she came up to me and she said, you know something, you're going to be far more successful posthumously. <laughs> oh, my gosh. oh, my gosh. Oh, it, was, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. And, you know, for a moment I wondered, what should I say? And then I said, well, thank you very much indeed. So that's fine. And uh, it was a lovely remark to make to somebody. It really was. Mind you, there was, you do get, when you're on tour, you do get rather odd things happening. I had a very odd thing happening in, in, in one of my American tours when I was talking in a book, bookstore and there was about 350 people. It was a big, big bookstore with a big, big audience. And as I was looking at the audience, I noticed that there was this chap looking at me like this, you know, really very... <laughs> and, of course, it's fatal once you make eye contact with anybody. <laughs> I mean, that's why I'm looking at the lights up there. <laughs> I mean, 
Because if you make co eye contact with somebody who's making a sort of slightly threatening eye contact, whenever you look at the audience, your eyes go straight back <laughs> to... So this, this chap was looking at me like this, and for some reason, uh, best known to them, maybe there was some threat that I didn't know about, I had been given a bodyguard. I had a bodyguard with a gun. No. And he was standing, yeah, in a bookshop. And he was standing, he was standing next to me, and I said, I'm a little bit worried about that man over there. And he's, he looked and he said, yeah, I got him, I got him. He didn't shoot him, but nonetheless, <laughs> yeah. And uh, so there was this chap. And in the signing line afterwards, sure enough, he was in it. And he was coming and all looking like us as he came towards me. And he came up to the table and he looked at me and said, what are you doing afterwards? And, <laughs> <laughs> and all, my, all my keepers said, oh, he's leaving town. He's going, he's got to go back to the hotel. And then he reached down for something, and I thought this was it. You know, there was going to be a bomb or something. He reached for a bag, brought up the bag, and it was his book. And he'd <gasps> written the book. Oh. Uh, that's all he wanted was yeah. for me to read this book that he'd had privately printed, 550 pages. <laughs> and so he I was mighty relieved, mighty relieved. And uh, so I took, said, that's fine. And he didn't even want me to email my response to it. So I went back to the hotel, and really, Jess, it was, it was absolutely wonderful, because I started to read this thing, and I almost fell off my chair, because he'd written this 550-page book all about a man who was kidnapped by a shipload of nuns. Oh, my gosh! <laughs> And the nuns Did you skip to the last page? <laughs> well, well, and the nuns, without being too, too, too direct about it, were enthusiastic. And so, uh, yeah. Wow, this was a, perhaps a perfect Th gift. That but is the lost bestseller. That is <laughs> undoubtedly what would have put uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, knocked it into the... You know, <laughs> it, it would have made Fifty Shades of Grey look like Sorry. an interior... <laughs> Looked like an interior decoration <laughs> manual, you know, nothing. <laughs> so these, these, things, these things happen, and oh. you, you, you really have to be ready for them. Nothing like that would ever happen in Toronto. Toronto is a very, very polite city. I've always regarded That almost it sounds like a polite. challenge. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll be well behaved, though. We'll do our very best well to be behaved. well behaved. Um, I feel like this group. Raise your hand if you've read more than 10 of Alexander McCall Smith's book. Okay, raise your hand if you've read more than 15. Okay, 20. Uh, just for the record, Those are my how... publishers. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's like, yeah, publisher and I editor. I jolly well hope they have read yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> I've been watching. <laughs> so, so it's a tricky thing when we have someone as beloved and as well known as you. I don't want to take up this precious time by getting you to recap stories that I'm sure you've uh, heard a hundred times, but uh, or told rather a hundred times or more. But I will ask. Uh, just recently, a couple days ago, um, you wrote a, or had a poem published. I presume it was a fresh poem. Yes. Published yes. in the Sunday Times. Yes. And I presume, even though she wasn't mentioned by name, but it was uh, about Queen Elizabeth's passing. Y yes, it didn't mention her, but it, w it was it was about. I, I, yes, I'd been asked to do this, mm. and uh, I was. It's it's a difficult thing to do, really, <laughs> too. But uh, it came to me. It it came to me in in um, uh, extraordinary circumstances. I woke up at three in the morning, often with poetry. The lines come to me when I emerge from, from um, unconsciousness. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's as if they've been formed in, in the, the, that strange state between sleep and, and awareness. And uh, the, the lines were there. It was what, uh, what I wanted to say about it, which that particular poem really wanted, I wanted to say about how things happen that we, we know are in inevitable, mm -hmm. that there are certain features of the world that we think are going to always be there, and then are surprised when things change. And um, then uh, it then m moved on to just looking at, uh, said something about uh, duty and how, mm -hmm. how we, we feel that, that, that there are old fashioned virtues that we thought we could do without, mm -hmm. but actually we realize now we do need these virtues. Mm -hmm. uh, we do need uh, duty and we need love and courtesy to, 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 to others mm -hmm. um, because I think we can lose sight, sight of that. And so that's the, uh, so the Sunday Times, um, published it, 
um, and the BBC uh, read, it, read it out on the radio. So, so I, was, I was pleased, but uh, and I, one had to be careful about sentimentality and, and whatnot. But um, no, I was pleased. I do, I write quite a lot of poetry, and I, I have a collection which Random House uh, Toronto published uh, called In a Time of Distance, which, which has got a lovely, lovely cover um, it's a beautiful cover. There, beautiful cover by Ian McIntosh, who's um, my illustrator, my main illustrator in Scotland. Beautiful. And in fact, that's, it's, it's, it's a picture, sorry, we can't uh, show a larger thing, but it's a croft house in the west of Scotland, and oh, there's a, a, a washing line, drying line across the, um, across, is it being projected on there or not? No. I don't no. think so. No, 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 that's okay. There's a washing line across the front, and there's a suit, a man's suit, on the oh, washing sure. line. And uh, that goes back to something that happened to me years ago. I was tr traveling in the West Highlands of Scotland, and we drove past a simple croft house uh, quite close to the sea, and there was, it was gorgeous, you know, very beautiful, lovely, lovely, lovely green, and then going down to that lovely terrain, uh, which is called Macher in the west of Scotland, which is uh, shells and sand and wild flowers. It's just very beautiful. And there was this washing line with this dark suit, man's suit, flapping, and it'd been washed. The suit had been put in the wash and was <laughs> then hung up. And of course, the reason why you would have to wash a suit there was that the nearest dry cleaner would be an Inverness, which would be hours away. So you would wash your suit. And I was just taken with that. It was an extraordinary image. You know how some things you oh, see which, which just, and that, l that remained with me the picture of the suit flapping in the, uh, its arms flapping in, the, and I wrote a, wrote a poem um, here on the line before a croft, a suit has been hung, and it led to, so. and then the, 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 t the title poem, the collection is called In a Time of Distance, and the title poem is about how we uh, responded to uh, this time of isolation that we've all been, mm -hmm. been, been through, about how we rediscovered things about ourselves. We, we, we took our board games that we'd forgotten mm -hmm. the rules to, uh, played card games that we'd, we'd, we'd never heard of, um, looked at our lives in a, in a way. So um, I, 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 write, I write quite a lot of poetry. I write for composers as well. I write um, libretti and song cycles, and I've written some operas, which I, I really like. Truly? Mm. Oh my goodness, well, you've just led me down so many paths. I, I don't suppose we'd be lucky enough to have you read uh, something from would, there. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be quite lovely? We could, we I, could, I would yes, certainly enjoy yes. that. Um, and then I just, you said so many things, I have to follow up. So you I, read that. I, I could do one which, let me find it. There's, there's some um, poems here about books and the importance of books. That seems um, fitting. Which I will find in... Um, there's a poem about angels, a poem about uh, grocery stores. Well, you looked that up. I, uh, I did. <laughs> a poem about the College of Hypnotherapy. Next, right. That was a, that was a, p a poem which I wrote in a car in uh, traveling to um, Santa Barbara, between Los Angeles and Santa Barbara, in the car, going along the highway, or freeway, or whatever it is, a road, let's say. And uh, there was suddenly I saw this sign which said, College of Hypnotherapy, next right. Wonderful. Actually, I'll read that poem, because it's such a peculiar thing. Uh, there it was, this sign. Now, only in California would yes. you see a sign which said, College of Hypnotherapy, next <laughs> right. I was very taken with it. So, I, I, in the car, I wrote this, this poem. College of Hypnotherapy, next right. This winter sunshine, I'm going to stand up to read, you must stand up to read poems. Um, this, this winter sunshine, attenuated but still warm, is the democratic air through which the gliding limos and the working trucks move equally. Bare hills describe the outer limits to this Los Angeles landscape, indicate the boundaries of the possible in a place where anything can be done. For this is where illusion has its kingdom, where things can mean what you want them to mean, and more, where the paying customer is only too ready and willing to show that being fooled is satisfactory entertainment. The autumnal fall of leaves is not an issue here. <laughs> Along the banks of this interminable highway, 
are eucalypts, tipu trees, riots of bougainvillea, all asserting that perpetual summer pertains in this south. Even one suspects the lotus itself blooms here, tended for personal use, of course. Somewhere under the glitter of distant gleaming towers, somewhere under the acres of quite undifferentiated roofs, there is an odd history here of conquest, dispossession, of forgotten missions, of old and modern empires locked in a tawdry struggle for the right to name. And now Mexico seems ever closer than it was. Spanish seeps into the interstices of a Protestant life that's never been all that happy in the sun. Kisses and softens Anglo-Saxon place names that need only a vowel to make the transition <laughs> to sympathy and the guitar. The signs flash past, city of a thousand oaks, first exit ahead. I count only six, planted along an unexceptional concrete mall. 900 and more must be elsewhere. As many promises are in a place that assures you your future is attainable. And then a sign that warns, College of Hypnotherapy, next right. This says so much. You will leave the road, close your eyes, <laughs> and let your mind drift as it will, replace thought with no thought. Listen to my voice. This is the College of Hypnotherapy. <laughs> Speaking to you, next right. Now, don't put change off. Keep driving, do not flinch. You can be better. You can stop the things you want to stop. Believe in me and in this sign, College of Hypnotherapy, next right. Oh, that's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> what an absolute delight. <laughs> it's just wonderful. Now, before you read that, that beautiful poem, very entertaining poem, you dropped a, a few nuggets here that I'd never heard of before uh, in, in everything that, I, that I've read about you. Librettos? Yes. Uh, yes, I... I, what, I okay. Uh, How, is, there, is there a time when you're not creating something during the day? Well, <laughs> well yes. I mean, I, I, I do all the usual things. I mean, I watch Netflix and uh, ride my bike and all that. <laughs> but actually, uh, l writing uh, a libretto is something that I really enjoy. And in fact, I've written, I've written three chamber operas and wow. I've written a libretto for a full-scale opera, which is going to be done uh, next year by a, a Scottish opera. But the, the, uh, chamber, um, the first opera that I wrote was with a composer with whom I'd worked on song cycles, mm -hmm. uh, a, a very fine choral composer, lives in Edinburgh, Tom Cunningham. And um, I had gone, there's a rather interesting story behind it, I'd gone to Botswana with my um, New York uh, agent and my New York uh, editor, and I wanted to show them bits of the uh, Botswana um, because of their involvement in the Mara Matsui books. And we were up in the Okavanga Delta, and we were in a boat on the river, in this gorgeous bit of unspoiled Africa. You know, the Okavanga's really lovely. And there along the banks of the river were these great towering trees with various little, a few little huts in there. And I said to our guide, who was a marvelous man called Mighty. <laughs> Mighty was a <sighs> magnificent man, yes. yes. He's recently retired. Yes. And uh, he, he, was, he had the most wonderful eyesight. Uh, he would say, there's a giraffe over there under that hill about four miles away, and he'd say, yes, it's a giraffe. And I wouldn't even see the hill, but Mighty yeah. would say there's a... <laughs> and uh, so Mighty, Mighty had take, taken us, uh, was, was in charge of the boat, and I said, Mighty, what's that over there? And, they, and he said, those are the baboon people. And I thought, mm, what's this? And then uh, I have an amateur interest in primatology, mm -hmm. in that I read, as a very, very uninformed amateur, <laughs> works of primatology, which is, you know, and uh, I uh, had read a book called Baboon Metaphysics by uh, two American primatologists, a uh, husband and wife uh, pair, who had spent five years living with the baboons oh in the Okavanga Delta, uh, which is quite long. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, I think they'd gone out from time to time. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, they, they'd been studying this troop of baboons for five years, and they'd, they'd identify all the baboons, what they were doing, where they were in the pecking order, what their hobbies, interests were, were that sort of thing. And um, I suddenly occurred to me, this was the camp of these primatologists who'd hmm. written this book, highly obscure book, Baboon Metaphysics, published by an academic press in the US, of which I bought a copy, probably the only person <laughs> who'd bought it. The only lay person. And uh, so as the, I said to Mighty, we've got to go and see them. He said, oh, no, no, we can't. We, we never disturb them. They don't like to be disturbed. I said, Mighty, I'm sure. And I prevailed upon him uh, to, to take us. So we approached. And as we approached over the waters of the mighty Okavango River, I cupped my hands and I shouted out, I've read baboon metaphysics. <laughs> And out of the hut, <laughs> under the trees, the, this couple came out waving their hands. So <laughs> <laughs> this is marvelous. And they, they were terribly keen for me to come ashore. And so as we approached, and we had our, 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 our Mr. Stanley and Dr. Livingston moment, because he came to the edge, he said, I think I know who you are. And I said, I think I know who you are. And so we went, we went ashore, and they gave us a cup of tea, <sighs> uh, which was really very nice. And we chatted about baboons. And, and, they, and then uh, they were really nice my c nice couple with whom I r remained in touch. And then, uh, then they said, uh, they explained how female baboons are ambitious for their male partner, and they will want their male partner's status. So they'll encourage their male partner, <gasps> which is really quite unusual. And the young baboons have the status of the parents, which is really unusual in the animal world, because usually, you know, animals just take their... Uh, if you're not dominant, it doesn't, you know. And anyway, um, so this was, this was really interesting that the female baboon would encourage her, her male to, you know, have a good fight and, and go up the, 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 the pecking order. So when I got back to Scotland, I spoke to my friend Tom Cunningham and said, do you realize, uh, Tom, that um, uh, baboons have Lady Macbeth issues? <laughs> And he said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and then I said, Tom, we, we, we must write an opera. And he said, well, yes, that's quite a good idea. Let's write it. And then I said, I'd like to set it in a tribe, uh, a troop of baboons in Botswana, and it would be about the Macbeth story. And he looked at me, and he clearly thought I'd had a touch of sunshine. <laughs> and so, so he, he uh, we, we started, and we, we did it, and Tom wrote the most beautiful music for it. And it's oh telling the story of, of, of Macbeth and the murder of Duncan and the ambition of Lady Macbeth and uh, justice eventually being So from the actual perspective of Lady Macbeth rather than the baboons? From the perspective of, well, there was a Lady Macbeth baboon and there was a Duncan baboon <laughs> and Macbeth. You're, you're being quite... Uh, yes. Oh, and my so all Lord. And so all the baboons had, there was a baboon called Macbeth and one on. So it, and it really worked. And we... <laughs> How could it not? <laughs> <laughs> and now, I had set up a little opera house in the bush in Botswana called the Number One Ladies yes. Opera House, which was very small. It was a converted garage. It had been used for repairing cars. And I got a, a five-year lease of this and put a sign outside saying, Number One Ladies Opera House. And it was, it was really beautiful. It was beautiful inside. It had lovely seats a little cafe, and oh. this was available for amateur dramatic societies and whatnot. And we did the first opera translated into the Setswana language there. We did, we did a, a, a tr um, translation of Cavalleria Rusticana into Setswana, and it went very well. And the, we, we then had the premiere of the um, Okavanga Macbeth in, in this little opera house. And it was such a beautiful occasion. It ran for a week, which is what we planned. And... Uh, <laughs> The, 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 the young people who were singing, we had two trained voices. Mm -hmm. Two of the singers had had a bit of training, uh, but the others were all, um, were all just uh, enthusiastic amateurs. Mm -hmm. But of course, in Africa, people love choral singing. You know, it's part of the culture, yeah. it's really very. And so we had some very, very, um, very fine singers. And the, the young people who were, they were sort of 20, uh, early 20s, 20 or something. They just absolutely loved it. They, 
and uh, one of them came along to me and said, this is the best thing that's happened in my life. Oh which my is, you goodness. know, really nice. That's beautiful. And uh, then it was, it was recorded, the Okavanga uh, Macbeth is recorded, and, and it's had uh, subsequent um, performances, uh, and it's very tuneful. What I'm doing now is I've just finished um, uh, writing a libretto with a composer in London called Thomas Hyde, who's a very fine composer. Uh, his last opera was for English National Opera. He wrote an opera called That Man, Stephen Ward, which was part of the Profumo scandal that, based on that. Mm. And uh, Tom and I have written an opera about the disappearance of Lord Lucan. Oh you know, the, the missing, the chap who did the nanny yeah. in the air. And uh, we, we have a very good ending for him uh, because... <laughs> Uh, he, you know, he, he murdered the wrong person. Then they found his car at one of the channel ports and they never found him. And since then, it's kept the, 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 the newspapers going for years. <laughs> Lord Lucan, seen in New Zealand. Uh, he's been seen in New Zealand. He's been seen in Goa. He's been seen in the middle of Africa. Presumably, he's, he's probably living in he's Toronto. He's <laughs> Remember when you said, don't look anyone in the eye? <laughs> yes, you know, a hand goes up at the back. Excuse me, I was never in Goa. Um, you know, if he gave himself away in that way. But um, so we've done, uh, we've done this uh, op opera on the d disappearance of Lord Lugan. And the end we have, he goes to South America and he has what happened. What he did to that poor victim is done to him. He's walking by a river and he's mistaken for somebody else, which is what happened in his case. He mistook the nanny for his uh, ah. wife and did the nanny, and, you know, it's really, it's a dreadful case. <laughs> so he actually is done in on the side of the river in South America, and then he's chopped up and fed to piranhas. Oh my so, goodness. you know, it's a sort of, it's one of the few operas in which piranhas appear. <laughs> <laughs> now, because <laughs> operas I have, have to ask, <laughs> writing operas, poetry, uh, yeah. numerous children's books, of course your novels, mm -hmm. your, your short stories, uh, we know so much about your writing. What sort of reader are you besides primate metaphysics? What are the things, are, are you returning to, are you the type of reader, do you return to your beloved uh, texts or are you hungry for new things? I, I often like reading the same thing uh, twice. Mm -hmm. I've got very, very eclectic uh, reading tastes as I think most of us have. So I read a lot of nonfiction. I read quite a lot of philosophy. Um, I uh, quite r r like reading simple science, you know, science which hasn't got any numbers in it or <laughs> equations. Uh, so I've recently read a book on electricity, which wow. is really, t I'd never read a book on electricity before. And so that was a, an area of my um, education that had been neglected, you know. It's, it's really, I feel quite bitter about that, actually. <laughs> That I go through the school system and I never read uh, about uh, electricity, <laughs> and so I, I read I read those and and very curious. Uh, I I love uh, I love reading very unlikely things. If I find a telephone directory, I love a telephone directory. A telephone directory, the social detail you get in a, a telephone directory is quite extraordinary. Um, there's very strong on characters, a lot of characters, uh, weaker on plot, but it's yeah. really. Uh, <laughs> But it's, it's very good. Well, the, the, the old telephone directories, um, I recently moved outside of uh, Toronto yep. into, into a city called Hamilton yep. and uh, bought a 100-year-old house. Yes. And so wanted to do a little bit of research about the house. And all of these old directories yes. are available online at the yes. libraries, Vernon's directories. Yes. And it's just fascinating to it's see. Wonderful. They Not only do you have the, the name and the address, but it's the profession yes. of everyone as well, which yes. is uh, deeply There's an immense satisfying. amount of social history there. Yes. Uh, I, love, I li lived briefly in Swaziland many years ago, and the Swaziland telephone directory was only about uh -huh. that thick. Uh, so I read quite a bit of it. And... Uh, <laughs> And it was absolutely wonderful. <laughs> there, was, there was somebody called Charlie P. Charlie. <laughs> and then there was another place called the Uncle Charlie Hotel. Just really nice. It was a <laughs> really, very, very good read. Very calming. Very calming. <laughs> very calming, yes. So I read, I read very, very broadly. Now, would you, um, there was a beautiful <laughs> 2005 um, episode, BBC's uh, Desert Island Discs. I don't know if anyone listens to us, a beautiful podcast slash radio show. And, oh, nice, nice shout out. And I've listened to your episode twice, not to brag. <laughs> um, and I'm very curious to know that the premise of the show is a, a guest, varied guest, fascinating guest, 
um, sort of choose five pieces of music that, eight pieces, thank you, eight pieces of music that um, sort of uh, mark periods in their life and then they talk about those moments in the life and what that music represents. And then at the end, the guest is asked, uh, they're allowed, they're being sent off to a desert island. Uh, they're allowed uh, three items. They're getting sent with the Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare. But they get to choose one album, one other book, and a luxury item. And I'm very curious to know if your three things are still the same. Your album or track was a, a Mozart, was it a libretto? It, it's Mo Mozart's the trio from yes. um, Soave, uh, from Cosi Fantuti. It's Soave Seal Vento. And I love that piece of music. In my view, that's the most beautiful music piece of music ever composed by anyone. Um, it's just gorgeous. It, it's, Cosi Fantuti is rather a silly opera, you know, the plot is, the plot is. is, is, is a bit ridiculous. But the uh, that and that piece of music is is sung in circumstances of deception, mm. and yet the words are so beautiful. May the uh, may your 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 voyage be may the wind that takes you on your voyage be a gentle one. So mm. obviously, May uh, may all your desires be be brought to you on this this journey. And it's a lovely song of a song of farewell in a sense. Uh, uh, the sentiment is so so beautiful, and the music is so beautiful. So I listen to that quite often. You write and to it. Well, when I when I'm writing one of my Isabel Dalhousie mm -hmm. books, I'll put Suave Seal Vento on uh, on the uh, uh, the whatnot and listen to it. <laughs> I don't know what one plays. <laughs> I almost said gramophone, and then thought, oh, they'll they'll think I'm really old. They'll think I'm we really. Know. We really old-fashioned if I have a gramophone, <laughs> but I put it on the uh, the gramophone and listen. <laughs> <laughs> I wind up the gramophone and put it on, and uh, and it's 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 a really lovely piece of music. And then I don't know what else. What else did I choose? I can't remember that. Well, first I'll continue on. But do you have a different soundtrack for when you're getting into a different series? Yes, I do. Uh, I will listen to uh, if I'm uh, uh, writing the uh, the Mara Matsui books. I will often, interestingly enough, I won't play specifically African music, although I like, I, I love African traditional music, uh, but I would play um, Penguin Cafe Orchestra. Oh my goodness, I like love them. Penguin Cafe Aren't they Orchestra. Great? And I can there understand why. Yes. What a be yeah, that's beautiful so, music. It's so eclectic, it's such wonderful, it's, it's a bit of early music, they're using these early instruments. Oh, I think, I think Penguin Cafe Orchestra oh, is I terrific. I love that. Yeah, and uh, uh, so. Scot uh, S Scotland Street? Scotland Street, probably I will play something Scottish for that, and I will play, uh, I, I love um, Mist-Covered Mountains, played on the pipes, is just absolutely heart-rending, absolutely heart, heart beautiful. Some of those Scottish uh, pipe tunes are just so beautiful, Loch Arbor No More, Dark Island, uh, and another one I play, another uh, beautiful piece of Scottish music, uh, is a song written by the late Hamish Henderson, who was um, a marvelous poet and folklorist, uh, whom I knew just very, very, uh, uh, very uh, slightly. Mm -hmm. um, and Hamish, Hamish was in the 51st Highland Division in the Se Second World War, mm -hmm. and was in Sicily when the 51st Highlanders went in liberated Sicily and then moved up a, 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 into, uh, in, into Italy, uh, the rest of Italy. And um, he took a, a pipe tune called Farewell to the Creeks, and he wrote these marvelous words for, for that. And it's the most haunting, oh, gorgeous. Wow. So I like to play that. And uh, I, also, I also play, um, when I'm about it, if I play that, I might then play Shoals of Herring, which oh. is a, a, a song about a, a young man who goes off fishing uh, with oh. the herring boats. Yeah. And I, it's the sort of song they sing over in Newfoundland. Yeah. That they sung a lot in, in Newfoundland, that sort of thing. The uh, book you were bringing to the desert island was uh, any sort of complete co collection of W.H. Auden. Well, Auden. That he, he's yeah. so, uh, he's very near and dear to you, isn't uh, his work or, or is? Auden is my greatest literary enthusiasm. Uh, W.H. Auden, uh, I remember the precise moment I first 
took a book oh. of Auden's um, collected uh, poetry. I was, it was when I was in my first job in this life, my first actual proper job, uh, was I was lecturing at Queen's University in Belfast. Mm -hmm. At a very difficult time, there was uh, effectively a, a, a low-grade civil war going on at the time. It was a time of heightened feeling. Mm -hmm. uh, in time of, of war and conflict, uh, it's extraordinary how uh, people read more newspapers, their sense of being alive is somehow made more intense. It's a curious phenomenon. And so it was a very strange time uh, for, 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 for me and for everybody living there. Mm -hmm. And um, I went into the university library and I happened upon this, uh, this book, uh, Collected Shorter Poems of W.H. Auden. And I remember taking it off the, mm -hmm. off the shelf and borrowing it and taking it off and suddenly realizing that here was this marvelous, humane voice. Um, I, and one of the first poems I read in that book was his In Memory of Sigmund Freud, mm. where he writes about how Freud was um, able to liberate us from uh, the, the oppressions that we imposed on ourselves. And with gorgeous lines, there's one line where he says, um, because of Freudian do uh, doctrine and freeing us from our... our um, our fears, uh, he said, able to approach the future as a friend without a wardrobe of excuses. <gasps> what a lovely line. And in fact, Auden, there's, a, there's a, um, a marvelous short poem that he wrote, which I think says it all. If you're looking for a um, philosophy of life, if you're looking for something to get you through, there's this beautiful little poem. and. Uh, called The uh, More Loving One. And the, the two lines there, which I think state an entire philosophy in two lines. If equal affection cannot be, then let the more loving one be me. Oh. And that, will you think of that? Think of what that means. Effectively, it's saying the world can't love us as we would like the world to love us. The world, we feel sometimes rejected and injured by the world, or it's disappointing. We're never going to get, necessarily, what we want from the world. But, in spite of that, we must, we must give love. Mm -hmm. So, if equal affection cannot be. It's, uh, so, Auden, Auden really is a, is, a, is a wonderful poet. And, in fact, uh, so I read a lot of Auden, was very keen on him. And then, when I started to write these novels, I would often quote or Auden and Isabel Dalhousie. I quoted Auden, Isabel, as it happened, happened to be an Auden fan. Curious coincidence, that, but <laughs> there she was. And so we had, we had a lot of Auden. And then um, along came a letter from W.H. Auden's uh, literary executor in New York, uh, Edward Mendelssohn, who's written all these marvelous works of, of, of criticism and commentary on Auden's work. And Edward wrote to me a beautiful letter. Uh, he he'd been reading the number one ladies' detective agency. He's professor of English at Columbia University. He's the Trilling Professor of English there. And he wrote and he said, I'd just like you to know that W.H. Auden and Mara Motswe would have agreed on 100% of topics. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, I, was, I was so pleased. To, to get this letter. So I wrote back to Edward and said, well, thank you so much, because it was the next best thing. I couldn't hear from Auden himself, because he, as Mara Motswe would put it, was late. <laughs> was uh, late but, yes. uh, uh, but uh, nonetheless, I got this letter from Edward. So I said, well, thanks so much for that. And when I'm next in New York, uh, could, we, could we meet for lunch? And he said yes. And, and so we, we, met, we met for, for, I met Ed, Edward and his wife for, for lunch in the Russian tea rooms mm. uh, in, in New York. And it was the beginning of, of a very long friendship. And um, I said to him, would you like to be in my Isabel Dalhousie books? And he said, well, yes, he would, because he'd only been in a novel once before, and he hadn't come out terribly well. <laughs> and so, and I thought that this obviously was, was completely unjust. So uh, I said, OK, we'll put you. So the next Isabel Dalhousie novel, I had um, Edward Mendelssohn in the novel. He came, under his own name, he came to Edinburgh to give a lecture on the sense of neurotic guilt in the works of W.H. Auden. <laughs> and uh, Isabel, in the book, goes to the lecture, and she enjoys this. The next year, I invited the real Edward Mendelssohn to come to Edinburgh 
and to give the lecture in real life. No! That, yes. That oh, he'd, that's wonderful. That he'd given in, in the book, in real life. And so he gave this lecture. We had about 300 people came. And then afterwards, my wife and I had all the people in the Isabel real people <laughs> who I'd mentioned in who knew one another in the virtual world to come and have dinner together. They oh all had dinner goodness. together. And it was really, now you'd think I'd have better things to do with my time, but it actually was a, <laughs> it really was a very That's good. That's marvelous. That's marvelous. I believe actually that uh, reality and fiction should be sort of intertwined. So I put real, real people in, in, my, in my books. Uh, there was one uh, occasion when I was, uh, some years back, I, I w encountered at some, some do, I encountered the then first minister of Scotland. Mm. And he, he said uh, that he was re reading the book. So I said, well, um, Mr. McConnell, would you like to be in the Scotland Street book? He said, oh, yes, yes, thank you. Yes, <laughs> and so I then had to work out what I could do with the first minister of Scotland in one of the Scotland Street books. And so... Uh, I sort of sat on, and so I had Bertie, who's one of my favorite characters, <laughs> little Bertie. Uh, he's such a nice little boy <laughs> who's got this major mother problem, you know. Yes. We've got the most, you, uh, you may not know this, Jess, but we've got, in Edinburgh, we've got the highest instance of pushy mothers of <laughs> anywhere in, in Scotland. Now, I have heard, <gasps> I have heard that Toronto has quite a high... Uh, <laughs> incidents of this. It's not for me to say. Not for you not to, for me say. to say. But I have heard there's certain parts of Toronto where the instance of Pushy Mother is way above <laughs> what you'd get in all the prairie provinces and oh, all put together. And Alberta and BC coast all to added coast together to, coast. to Toronto. <laughs> I, I, that's what I've heard. I don't, I don't know whether it's true. But Irene Bertie's ma mother is really pushy. Bertie starts off the books as six. He's six for eight years in these books. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> he, she, makes him, uh, she makes him learn Italian so he can appreciate mm -hmm. Italian culture. He, he, um, go, he learns saxophone. He has saxophone <laughs> lessons. Uh, he does a very good rendition of As Time Goes By from Casablanca, <laughs> which in his case it doesn't. Uh, he, uh, yeah. He, he goes for yoga classes called Yoga for Tots, where the children are so small they can't even get into the yoga positions. They have to be pushed by their push mothers into the <laughs> yoga positions. Oh and he gosh. has psychotherapy. <laughs> and uh, all the time he just wants to be an ordinary little boy, little boy yeah. leading an ordinary little boy's life. And, and what he particularly wants, well, he wants two things. He firstly wants to turn 18, because he's heard that when you're 18, you can leave your mother and go, yeah. and, go and live in Glasgow. So, uh, so he's quite keen to do that. And the other thing that he's, he's keen to do is to have a Swiss Army penknife. Because every little boy wants a Swiss, and most men want yes. a, a Swiss Some Army penknife. So uh, occasionally I give Bertie a little glimpse of, of freedom. I, I did, uh, he recently went fishing with his father in the Pentland Hills. A mist came down, they got lost, they ended up at a farmhouse. Farmer's wife was very good, she said, come, come away and give you a cup of tea, I'll get my husband to take you back to the car and whatnot. And Bertie finds that there's a real little boy in that house, leading a real little boy's life. Oh He's my called gosh. Andy. And Andy says to Bertie, Bertie, would you like to see my things? And Bertie says, oh yes, I'd like to see. And so Andy takes him up to his room, opens the drawer, and there in the drawer is not one but six Swiss Army Oh, my knives. gosh. And his little heart fills with oh. delight. And Andy reaches for one of these penknives and says, this Bertie is a Swiss Army penknife. The Swiss Army fights only with penknives. <laughs> and Bertie says, I've heard That's that. That's beautiful. So he has this. But reality, you see, I do use reality, and I do use things that have happened to me, Joseph. I may I tell you a story about this? Of course. Um, this is about is how okay? real experiences can be put into fiction. Uh, I've uh, written a, a book called My Italian Bulldozer, which is published by, uh, by, by uh, uh, Random House in, in Toronto. And that I is all about somebody who goes to, to, to Italy. Now, that was based on experiences I had because I was wanting to finish writing of a book. And uh, I said to my wife, I really need to get away and get a couple of weeks complete 
piece and mm -hmm. write the same. And she said, that's fine. And I said, I think I'll go to Italy because I'm a great Italophile. I love, love Italy. And I in particular like a little town called Montalcino in the Sienese Hills, where they make a very fine wine called Brunello <laughs> de Montalcino. <laughs> Highly recommended uh, for people of all conditions. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, so I got on a plane from Edinburgh to Pisa. And on the plane, I found myself sitting next to this man who was an Italian businessman who dealt in ceramics. And he'd been selling tiles and bathroom things in Scotland and was going back from his business trip. He, like most Italians, was very friendly, conversational. We had a good conversation on the plane. We landed in Pisa, and um, <laughs> the airport tower's straight, by the way. <laughs> Hardly Sorry, get that I, out. You were so excited. Sorry, I just thought I'd mention that. It doesn't. It doesn't go. Okay. And thank anyway, you. so we landed in <laughs> we landed in Pisa, and uh, uh, I went in, into the arrival hall, and I would booked a car, a rental car. So I went up to the car rental place and said I'd like my car, and they said, "Could we see your ID?" I gave my passport, and then they said, um, "No, no reservation," and I, I said, "I have made a reservation," mm -hmm. and we've. I'm expecting a car. No. And so, uh, fortunately, I had an email. And I said, this is the email which confirmed you know, mm -hmm. that I'd reserved the car. The young man behind the desk looked at it, and he said, this is no longer valid. <laughs> so I was, you know, this was the beginning of an altercation. And at that point, my friend from the plane had collected his suitcase. He came past, <gasps> my new friend. Yeah. He said, is everything all right? And I said, well, not really. Yeah. They are refusing to honor this reservation. And he said, well, ask them for another car. And he said, good, another car. They said, no, no, sorry, it's a holiday weekend. All our vehicles are out. My new friend said, don't worry. I've got a friend who's got a vehicle rental place not far from here. Come with me, oh. and we'll fix you up. Typical Italian mm -hmm. kindness. So off we went, a couple of kilometers to his friend's vehicle rental place. Great welcome there, a mm -hmm. lot of shaking of hands. And, and mm -hmm. then <coughs> he, I, uh, he explained to his friend, that I needed a vehicle, and his friend said, terribly sorry, oh, uh, no. all the cars are out, it's a holiday weekend, I've only got one vehicle left, and that is a bulldozer. <laughs> and so, I said, I, I can't, I, I, I can't drive a bulldozer, I can't, my license says license oh. to drive cars, and he said, no, no, in Italy, cars include bulldozers. <laughs> So I was really stuck, Jess. I was really, really stuck because these people were being so nice. I couldn't, I couldn't say, you know. Oh so my goodness. he said, "Come out and." Uh, so I went out to look at it. And you know, when you rent a vehicle, you walk around it and check. Yes, it. check so the dents. I, I walked around the bulldozer. Walked around the bulldozer, <laughs> and everything was okay. And uh, and so I went back in and I signed the rental agreement. And then he gave, he showed me the bulldozer. He said, "This lever here, push that forward, you go forward." That's reverse that one. That's the blade. Don't touch that one. Oh so, and so I set off on the bulldozer, uh, on this rented bulldozer. And um, I set off for Montalcino. And it was actually really rather nice going through the Italian I countryside on this. a bulldozer because you're quite high up. Yes. And, and you can see all the surrounding features. And if there are any features that you don't like, well, you're on a bulldozer. So, you, you know, so off we set. And eventually I got to Montalcino, and well, I... Four days later? Uh, no, 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 it wasn't, no, it, it took me, I think it took about nine and a half hours. Oh. But I eventually got there, and I went to this hotel, a lovely little hotel in Montalcino called the Albergo Il Giglio, the Lillian. Mm. And fortunately, when I went there, they did have my reservation. Oh, they and they said, yes, we've got a room there, and you can park your bulldozer around <laughs> the back and say... Give so, the keys to the valet. Yeah. And so I had a really nice time. I had two weeks there. I got a lot oh. of work done. Every morning I went and had coffee in this lovely fin de siècle cafe in the main piazza. And I got talking to the local priest who had his coffee at the same time. We became great friends, yeah. chatted away. And the day before I left, the priest said, my brother's got a wine estate just on the edge of Montalcino, and he wonders whether you would like to come for lunch tomorrow. So I said, well, yes, of course. <laughs> And then the priest said, could we go on your bulldozer because <laughs> his, his car was in the garage. So, so the next day, the priest and I got onto the bulldozer <laughs> and we drove off to the wine estate. And the brother was really welcoming. He said, come in, come in. And a simple, I prepared a simple Tuscan meal, eight courses. And we had this wonderful <laughs> yeah. lunch. And then at the end, the brother said, 
uh, I'd like to show you the vineyard. Come out and see the vineyard. Now, the, the vineyard, in, to produce Brunello Montalcino, you, you, Montalcino, you must be in a very strictly circumscribed zone of production. And outside that zone of production, you can produce wine, but it's called Rosso de Montalcino, and you don't get nearly the, good, the same good price for it. So this was the, the he, he said, unfortunately, we're just outside, said, okay. outside the zone of production, and the, the boundary of the zone of production is that little stone wall you see oh running in that direction. God. And then you said, do you think you could possibly, uh, <laughs> what could I say? I, I, I really couldn't say no. So I got on the bulldozer and reversed, and then I took a good run, and I shifted no. the zone of production to the other side of his vineyard. Oh he my was, goodness, wow. He, he, was, he was so grateful, he was so grateful. We went back in and he said, thanks so much. I'd like, we, you know, we must drink a toast. And so he got one of his bottles of wine and we drank a toast in what was now Brunello de Montalcino. Yeah. <laughs> D-O-C-G. <laughs> That is marvelous. <laughs> I'm Just not sure how marvelous. likely that story is, but... Is it yeah. 8 o'clock? Wow, it is 8 o'clock. I Can you believe it? Oh, this was uh, an absolute delight. Uh, it doesn't feel like it should end. This feels wrong, could, but it does. I, Another hour? Can, I can't. I'm just can kidding. I we can't. One, one can I ask one little question? Your uh, book means... Uh, your books mean so much to so many people. You create <clears> these worlds... Uh, and you fill them with characters who have quiet introspection, characters that we would, I think, all love to spend a great deal of time with. Now, you have been telling us stories, blending maybe fact with fiction. Yes, yes. So let me play, <laughs> let, me, let me turn that back to you. You're having a dinner party, your lovely wife and two daughters, yep. they're not available to come. And you have a spot for three people, yourself and three people, there's going to be four of you. Obviously, you're serving Brunello. Which three characters from your books would you invite, and what would you cook them? Well, I'd, I'd have to invite Mara Matsui. I'd probably have Mara Matsui, Isabel Dalhousie, and Bertie. Bertie, yes! And Bert, Bertie would have pizza. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he'd, have, he, he'd have pizza uh, with, to, to, with additional tomato sauce. Um, Mara Matsui would have beef. Okay. Uh, she would love uh, beef. She'd like some good Scottish beef, and she'd mm -hmm. compare it with the Botswana beef. And uh, who else did we have? We had Isabel Dalhousie. Isabel. She'd have risotto. Oh yeah. Uh, because she likes risotto. Could I before we could I read one tiny poem before we finish? I don't think time? anyone would mind. <laughs> and this could be. Have we finished? Have you finished? Yes. So this could be. I could finish with this. Is that all right? Uh, th this is a poem which. Uh, which is, comes into one of the Scotland Street books, because in the Scotland Street books at the end, I always have a poem which I say is composed by Angus Lordy, one of the characters. Uh, I write it for him. And this was in the um, Love in a Time of Bertie, and this was Angus's poem, just a brief poem. Um, Love, he began, is as often about what does not happen as it is about what actually occurs. Love is to be found in things unsaid, when it would be easy or tempting to say something harsh or unkind. Love is a matter of silences, just as much as it is of open declaration. Love is never concealed nor disguised. Its face and position are always familiar, which means that it is only rarely mistaken for what it is not. Love is not diminished by use. That is its particular miracle. Love fills the entire space it is offered, never denies those who approach it, turns none away who mean what they say. Love merely warns, make sure you choose that form of my expression that is true to you. Love remains on duty constantly, is never dimmed by night, nor too faint to assume the demands of the day. If you would say anything about love to one about to embark on life's journey, it might be this. There is only one guide to which you should pay attention, and that guide is love. Only one voice whose whispers should be heeded, and that voice is love. Remember that, my dear. I ask you to remember that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Thank you so much.